Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome everyone. We are having this workshop to hear a presentation on the Riverfront Island Master Plan Final Draft Plan. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Chair Bison and the Planning Board and our Planning Department and Halverson Design, who are our consultants for this project. Thank you to both city staff and Halverson for working on this project, along with the committee and all of the members of the public who have helped provide feedback thus far. Development of our riverfront and canal system represent huge economic potential for our city, and I'm excited for your presentation tonight. Uh, please uh, introduce yourselves and uh, take it away. All right, good evening. My name is Shelley Norton. I'm the city planner. I'm here this evening with Rob Adams from Halverson Design. Uh, just a little background on this project. In um, 2010, the city received funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to support ongoing efforts that we had been undertaking on re revitalizing our riverfront. A portion of that funding was dedicated to developing a master plan for the riverfront area, which was completed in 2012 and was adopted by the city council. Since this time, staff, the planning board, city council, administration have been working through the implementation of this plan. And um, after about a 10 year period, it became apparent that a number of the items had been completed. And a number of um, items in the plan, we felt there needed to be a deeper dive to determine the next steps for further implementation. So um, in the July of uh, 2022, we entered into a contract with Halverson to do an update to the plan. The uh, update was for the purpose of focusing on five distinct areas uh, for further design and update. The first is the Riverwalk Trail and pedestrian movement plan and design. Island Point, looking at that as a, a specific, uh, more detailed design area. Oxford Street, Lincoln Street, and lower downtown infill and redevelopment plan, looking at a uh, number of parcels that the city owns and how those might be utilized. Update of the Simmered Payne Park design and looking at how that park functions. And finally, in um, 2018, the city acquired the canals and now has ownership of them. So canal improvements and public access to the canals is considered in part of this update. So um, over the course of the last number of uh, eight or nine months, the city and Halverson Design has been working on this update. We've had two different public information sessions on October 12th and January 12th. Uh, we've had a website where we've taken a number of public comment that became live the week of Bloom <coughs> Festival in August of 2022. And we had a stakeholder advisory group that was formed that has been working and providing feedback along the way, along with staff, as well as the public. <coughs> so the, the next steps, so tonight Rob is here to look at this draft master plan with all of you to get feedback before the plan is finalized. Um, and one of the hopes for staff this evening is that council and planning board will look at the implementation recommendations that he'll be providing and provide us a little bit of a, a guidance as to where to put our energy in the next coming months um, for looking at what we might be teeing up for uh, a way of grants or other things that, that we may need to do a little legwork to start <laughs> moving forward um, before we get more detailed recommendations from the two boards in uh, April when this comes for probably April adoption. So um, without further ado, I'll ask Rob to get started here and uh, hope that we have a robust discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Rob Adams with Halverson Design. We're a New England based uh, landscape architecture urban design firm. Uh, our primary office is in Boston, uh, but we also have offices in Portland, uh, Rhinebeck, New York, Connecticut, uh, essentially all over New England. Um, we've been doing urban design landscape architecture for uh, a couple decades now and um, our work is primarily in New England uh, we know the community we know the culture we know the climate and so we like to stay uh, stay close to home so to speak so tonight I'm gonna be super casual um, I hope tonight's a conversation as much as anything we have uh, some highlights of the of the visioning plan that we're gonna share tonight 
it's not the entire plan. I don't want to give away the entire farm uh, tonight, so there'll be something left to look at uh, come in April. Um, but as Shelley said, really the aspiration is to have a dialogue. We have uh, what we think uh, and have uh, gotten lots of feedback from the uh, city of Lewiston as well as communities, some good ideas. And the visioning plan is really about kind of creating momentum, putting some good ideas out there and starting to give weight uh, or priorities to those. And so that's really uh, what we're hoping to do uh, tonight. So we'll talk a little bit about the overall project objectives, talk about our process to date. I want to ensure you that it's been robust and inclusive. Talk a little bit about the planning process, again, that we've done, uh, some of the design, and then the key findings and opportunities. We also, part of our team was RKG. They're a market study firm, and they uh, broadcast both uh, a local net and a, a widespread data net. Uh, and then uh, Innis Design is an economic development, economic planning firm that assisted us as well. I like to say that Emily essentially provides us the ingredients and we try to you know, bake, the, bake the pie or cake, as you will. And then talk a little bit at the end about the implementation process. Again, we have some suggestions on what we think are good priorities and we've created a matrix, you know, given some weight to the different projects. But hopefully tonight, as Shelley said, we can talk about that in more detail. Um, so a few, uh, a little bit of housekeeping just to be clear on terminology and whatnot. So the Riverfront Island Master Plan, as Shelley said, was started uh, by one of our peer groups, Goody Clancy, uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Um, today, what we're talking about is an update to that, right? We're not redoing the plan. And so a lot of the good ideas in that plan, we're just not, we're not rehashing those, right? The idea is that those, those ideas stick around. So if we don't talk about art or other elements that were in that plan, it's because those were solid parts of that plan. This is essentially kind of a deeper dive onto these five areas that we talked about. So originally the goal was to transform the riverfront, right, of this overall master plan. Um, when I first came up to Lewiston, right, there's some really great bones uh, within the riverfront island area. The canals are amazing. The architecture's uh, really inspiring and solid. And so there's an opportunity, at least we see, with a, a, a lot of life and a vibrancy that can start to occur down in the riverfront, uh, river island, riverfront island area. And so, right, these essentially these five things that you see across the t in the middle here are stolen from the RFP basically, but these are essentially our marching orders, right? These are lenses that we were looking at. And then at the bottom, right, the RIMP update, right, which is what we're working on, was really focusing on, on five different areas that Kelly, uh, Shelley mentioned at the beginning, and we'll talk about those in more detail. And I think Shelley's gonna talk a little bit about some of the highlights from the original project. Yeah, so this is the next couple slides just look at the 2012 plan and where the city is on those uh, priorities and um, focus projects that that plan outlined. So just a little timeline here. Um, in 2010, we received the funding for the creation of the master plan, which also had a large element of implementation funding with it. Um, a little over $700,000 of that 900 was spent on implementation. The rest was spent on developing the plan. So the plan was adopted in the spring of 2012. The first project that really got underway was looking at a gateway entrance to Simmered Payne Park um, from Lincoln Street. And so that pedestrian connection, which you see in the photo here, was really the, the first project. Um, in following that, there was wayfinding signs that were put through the downtown. Next, we had um, in Simmered Payne itself, there was the development of the amphitheater, river access, and then there were some uh, electrical upgrades. Oxford Street was reconstructed. Um, Continental Mill was acquired by Chinberg, which uh, they've been a great partner with the city on work in the downtown along the riverfront. Um, there were improvements done by the city in uh, Lionel Potvin Park. There were bike and pedestrian upgrades along Cedar Street, so the median was put in, the um, pedestrian crossing signal was put in, the Lown Bridge received a road diet, which was a um, reduction in travel lanes creating a bike lane in 2018. 
uh, in the same year the city acquired the canals, so they're now city owned. Beach Street, um, there uh, was a new vehicular bridge that provides vehicular access and parking into Summer Payne Park, built in 2018. A number of um, beautification happened to the canals with clearing of vegetation, fencing um, was put in near Oxford Street and in the park itself over a period of a couple of years. Uh, just two years ago, the dock was installed in the park and this past year, the fitness court was installed on the Riverfront Trail. These are highlights, some other things have happened too, but um, just an overall um, highlight. And then from the 2012 plan, there was this um, implementation graphic, and so what we've done historically for the boards is provide updates every few years as to which pieces have been completed or are in process. Um, so you can see actually there's one with an X over it. Uh, the decision has been made not to put a new performance um, park um, where Mill 5 is right now. But um, you can see the ones with check marks are items that have been completed. And there's a number with green stars which are in process or have been partially completed. Uh, and then a number of others that that are waiting to, to get going and a number of those are related to the five areas of update that Halverson Design has been working on. Great, so uh, anybody, any questions to, to date, to now? So we've talked about these five initiatives, if you will, and this little graphic we have called the splash page for lack of better words. It, it essentially tries to encapsulate the overall project so as we talked, the river walk and its connections, um, and really the, one of the primary objectives is to connect Lisbon down to the river, right? This kind of east-west notion of connections. Island Point redevelopment, it's such a, an amazing spot, right? It's uh, underutilized, and a lot of the conversation around, around Island Point are it shouldn't be a place that's uh, sole use, right? It, because of its proximity to the falls, it's such a great public amenity. Whatever its redevelopment is should be accessible to all, and we should maintain as much access to it as possible. Third is the urban infill uh, and redevelopment. So there's essentially that swath of land from the, I'll say the Grand Canal, the larger Eastern Canal, all the way down to Oxford Street. Um, and so that area has a lot of, we'll call it missing teeth, right? Um, and there's a real opportunity uh, to think about that differently, to find a little bit of density, a little bit of life, a little bit of vitality to that area. Um, and then the last two are Samard Payne Park, uh, which is a standalone uh, kind of object, obviously, and then the canal revitalization. And it's important to note, like, none of these things are in a vacuum, or none of them are in a silo. It became very difficult for us to start to, like, divide them into different buckets because it's all interconnected and so we did our best and you may argue like oh that's not a canal project that should be a infill project or whatever but um, bear with us they're all part of the same uh, visioning plan so we talked a little bit about the process it was not done in a vacuum we find uh, community engagement to be uh, incredibly important for multiple reasons one to get voice and input from those that live work play in the area but also it, it creates um, stakeholders, right? It creates invested community. And so we find even with the smallest parks, if there's not been the public process, there's no one that's invested in it, there's nobody that cares about it, there's nobody that takes care of it. That applies to you know, larger scale project that, that applies to city planning. And so it's important to have community buy-in for all those reasons, um, as well as obviously it's the community's uh, property, it's community's land, so to speak, and so involving the community in the process. So we had, and, and I wanna say like Lewis and staff, uh, steering committee, everyone has been incredibly helpful in this process. We've had open door policy and everyone's been a resource. So that's been really helpful. Um, this little graphic you see, it, it's, it was really about this idea that there was our team and there was the Lewiston city uh, uh, project staff at the center. Steering committee was our advisory group outside of that. And then the larger community was this, you know, larger orbiting satellite. We had 
an initial kickoff meeting. We had two public open houses. The first one we call gather, which is where we're just obtaining information, right? Second one was share in which we, we took that information not only from that night, from the first meeting, but throughout the course of the process and essentially shared back the ideas. And I think at the end of the day, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but people were very receptive to the fact that a lot of the input that was given throughout the process was reflected in the, in the quote unquote share. Um, we had 11 interview sessions with stakeholders, Emily, who uh, isn't here tonight due to the storm, um, and uh, our, KG, our KG group sat down with various stakeholders, business owners, um, real estate agents, et cetera, uh, to talk about what was working and what's not working. We had a variety of fo focus sections, but at the end of the day, it was an overall iterative process. Talked about this, again, this idea of two meetings. Um, we also used what Shelley mentioned was Co-Urbanize, which was a website, uh, basically an online platform for people to um, provide input. And we found it um, helpful uh, in locations because not everybody can attend public meetings, right? You have kids, you have a night job, you have whatever. And so it became another point of input for people. And like in most instances, it didn't, necessarily unveil anything new or outstanding what it did was reinforce a lot of the input that we'd gotten to date which is great because you never know what kind of audience you have at some of these meetings and so to have a broader spec spectrum of input is always valuable um, so again that idea of co-urbanize it was great people can put you know pins on the map you can talk about like I love this thing here we put survey questions on there and and Ultimately, you know, we've used this, whether the city continues this or not, we use it as a way on a lot of our projects to disseminate information out to the public, right? If there's been a change to the design, if there's a new public meeting coming up, it's a tool that we've kept online for a lot of our projects to continue the output of information, not necessarily the input per se, but a way for us to share information as well. And so you'll see what we did at the first uh, meeting was really, we call them exercises. We gave people the right to vote um, and so not only did everybody get a dot or a couple dots, I think, and there was gold dots in which, you know, you put a gold star down and that, that was your trump card, so to speak, and that was the most important thing that you did all night. Um, but then there's also, right, we put some questions and we gave people the opportunity. There was a blank map up. So we got actually a, a, a good amount of uh, diverse information at that meeting. The second meeting where we shared another snowstorm, but um, it also had a positive turnout. Um, and there was uh, a good dialogue. There was less exercises there, but it was an opportunity for people to criticize or critique the uh, information that was shown. Larger project schedule, right? We are essentially at the end, um, and you can see there we kind of divided it up into inventory analysis, um, uh, working through the final visioning, and then this presentation tonight, and then up after tonight will be the essentially the packaging of the master plan based on your comments tonight and um, sub submission uh, sometime in April. Okay, so that was the process. So what did we find? <laughs> what, what did we do? We, we, and unfortunately you're getting the landscape architect to talk about economic development and marketing, which happened at the last meeting, so I'm pretty good at it now. But, um, so RKG did the market study and they broadcast again this larger global net uh, as well as global, uh, regional net from data, as well as had uh, multiple interviews with a lot of stakeholders. And there's really, I'll say, there's a whole plethora of information uh, that we'll provide in the final document, uh, so to speak, a, a data heavy uh, piece of uh, series of, of documents. But this, what you see up is really the, the key findings. And so ultimately population is expected to remain stable uh, the biggest change will be a shift to a smaller household size, which essentially means more households. May not mean more population, but just means more uh, more units, if you will. Um, and just some some validation of Lewiston being a, a regional employment hub. Uh, hiring is a challenge because there's low uh, unemployment right now. And then just an, uh, a kind of recounting of the largest sectors. Um, the strongest market is essentially housing. Uh, office, as, as we all know, is on the, on the downturn retail. There doesn't seem to be a lot of man, at least for development. Housing is, uh, seems to be the priority and has the greatest demand uh, within the Lewiston area. 
And part of that conversation is two things. This is an obvious statement, but cannibalism is not uh, what we're looking to achieve. And so when we say cannibalism, we mean not taking perfectly good storefronts, uses, activities, and trying to relocate them to other places. You'll see in a graphic in a little bit, like Lewiston has a really good system of organization of where commercial is, where retail is, where office is, and where housing could be. And so we're not looking to mix that up. We're looking to strengthen those kind of areas uh, with these improvements. And so there may be some amount of relocation to better from C class office space to A class office space, but we're not looking to shake up the overall structure. Um, the other uh, kind of comment is this idea of what other industries are looking to grow. Retail and hospitality, food and agriculture has actually been growing quite a bit here in Lewiston and in the, in the county. And so that's also seemed as an opportunity for growth. So that was, the, that was a nutshell of the market study. So looking primarily, so this next part, we're going to go through each of the five initiatives, talk briefly about some of the ideas. Again, it's not the full package, but just a taste of what we've been talking about. And then we'll move into the discussion around the implementation projects. So the um, initiative one was really about the river walk and about connections. And so we essentially mapped out, as you see here, this is what we'll call river walk south, um, which is more or less from, um, from Ash Street uh, towards the south. And we uh, identified what we thought was a, li a likely uh, alignment for, um, for the river walk. Not only likely alignment, but also started to look at what was city owned land, what were some quote unquote opportunities along the way, where were some, uh, some constraints. And so created a map uh, which started to identify uh, the possible routing of the river walk. And then we did obviously similarly to the north, the goal was to connect it all the way up to Avon Street um, and then to the south connect it uh, past Samard Payne Park. And there's a park that I can never remember down on the on the uh, south side. Yes, thank you. And so this is uh, you know that aspirational plan. Obviously, all of these projects require another firm to be hired. A visioning project is not getting down into the nitty gritty. We just make sure that it's a viable project and seems to make sense. Clearly, when another firm is hired, a lot of these kind of opportunities constraints will be more uh, sussed out, and actual documentation will occur. The other part that was important to the larger team was this idea of connections. And so um, Chestnut Street is obviously one of the major priority uh, connectors. Um, and Ash Street was identified as the greatest missing uh, link. Right? There's really no way to get from Lisbon Street down to the river except for Main Street or Cedar Street, and there's nothing in between. The problem is Ash Street uh, essentially falls apart, well, it falls apart right at Mill 5, but also is in a very concise kind of uh, western uh, circulation corridor once you get past Mill 5. So that was a key study area for us. Um, we identified a couple solutions. This is the more lofty solution of taking essentially the last structural bay of Mill 5 and turning that into an open air arcade. Uh, using the interior spaces of Mill 5 in the future to house elevators to provide that vertical transition that needs to occur to make it ADA compliant. There's other options where we can cantilever a walkway off the side of Mill 5, which has a lot of structural ambiguity to it. Not that this doesn't have a lot of structural ambiguity to it either. Um, and then there's other thoughts of maybe we span all the way across the canal with some structural members and have a we deck a portion of that. There's a lot of opportunities. Really the goal of this was to identify Ash Street and start to suss out or at least create some vision around what those connectors could be. Once you get to essentially Mill Street as part of the master plan, we've developed some, um, some renderings about how to connect then all the way down to the river. The other part uh, that we studied was uh, multimodal, was bike circulation. And so this is relatively low hanging fruit, identified what were some existing bike uh, circulations and tried to find some other critical connections, not looking to make every bike, make every street a bike corridor, but just providing some um, key connections, east, west, north, south, uh, that don't currently exist. And like all things, 
once you build it, they will come. But also bike uh, circulation is really about the network. Once the network is established, it becomes a more viable solution. When it's piecemeal, obviously, it's difficult to have a, a bike culture uh, in an environment where you're taking a life into your hands uh, in many locations. So that was some highlights of the, of the connectivity. Island Point um, was an interesting study. Really, the, the goal here was to unlock uh, a, a missed opportunity or a missed uh, a sleeping opportunity in Island Point. Great location, a lot of vertical grade change, almost 40 feet, I think, from top to bottom. Um, respecting the Veterans Park, but looking at uh, ways in which we could activate or enliven it. And I think a lot of the input from the community, as well as ourselves, was that it should not be a homogenous solution, right? An office park is not the solution for Island Point. Um, it also lacks connectivity, and so one of our primary focuses was converting Mill Street into a viable street, uh, regularizing that intersection of Main and Mill, uh, potentially signalizing it so that it does allow actual um, connectivity uh, into Island Point, and then really looking at developing the upper and the lower terraces and having that middle terrace essentially be vehicular and pedestrian circulation, the terraces being the 20-foot grade change that grade change that exists out there, as well as looking at what kind of life are we talking about for Mill Point. And so this example, one of the, the idea that we've landed on and promoting is kind of this office, uh, sorry, not office, uh, uh, retail, hospitality, um, maker space, kind of uh, a, 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 a yin and a yang to Samard Payne Park. Samard Payne Park's the passive kind of community neighborhood draw. Um, this would be more of an active, if you will, Thompson's Point, right? Uh, skating rink, climbing walls, maker space, um, hospitality, restaurant, brew pub, whatever it might be, amazing views. And so using, as well as using that vertical transition uh, for outdoor performances, amphitheaters. And then lastly, parking is always an issue. And the beauty of uh, Island Point is you can essentially create a two or three story parking structure if you wanted to without any excavation because of the grade change. And then looked at opportunities for food production, solar, et cetera, on top of that parking garage so that it's not just a dumb box, but it actually has a programmatic and financial uh, draw to it. So these were just some uh, initial thoughts for, for Island Point. And the one part that's, uh, we'll get to it in, in a bit. Um, and then uh, urban infill, um, this is the area I think that's probably the most uh, nebulous and harder to like draw pretty pictures around, if you will. But this is that diagram that we talked about around how uh, Lewiston already has a really good structure, right? Lisbon Street is the, is the retail corridor. Um, Canal uh, is essentially kind of this recreational space. It has a great uh, kind of pedestrian opportunity that we'll see in a little bit. The area from the canal down to Lisbon is office. That's where most of the mills are and have been converted into office. With, and then play down on Samard Payne Park, play cultural, et cetera, with the Museum LA, Samard Payne Park, and the river. And it's really that live piece that's the missing component, right? With residential being in the growth sector, looking to get people to live, work, and play within the downtown. And so that area from, from Lincoln to Oxford is the real ripe opportunity for, for development. And shockingly, one of the notes in there, in the community outreach, uh, there wasn't an aversion to height, like five, six stories, even more. Community didn't seem to, to be offended by height. There's a lot of um, precedent for five, six-story buildings here in Lewiston. And so there's seemed like uh, density was not um, was not a negative term, at least in the outreach that, that we had. And so we essentially created this idea: what if what if you know these orange parcels are essentially all the missing teeth or buildings without uh, historic uh, or programmatic significance per se? Um, and so what if these areas were consolidated over time, whether it's one or two parcels, whatever it might be? But what kind of uh, kind of urban fabric, what kind of design framework would we give? What, where would we hold street walls? Where would we look to promote retail? Understanding that we're not promoting retail along the entire stretch of Oxford or Lincoln, but using retail as a, essentially a Hansel and Gretel trail of crumbs down from Lisbon Street. So that as you're walking towards the river, 
you see this kind of glimmer of activity, this glimmer of ground floor activation, but we're not looking to move retail to, to this area. We're looking to keep retail and strengthen retail in Lisbon Street. So this plan essentially started to develop that. And out of that, and this is again, sadly, Emily's not here, part of our recommendation is gonna be around zoning, right? How can we make it easier? How can we make it better? How can we lower some of the threshold for residential development in this area? And so uh, Emily has created a whole kind of laundry list of recommendations for Lewiston, ranging from, you'll see, uh, changing some of the specific zoning requirements to starting to be a little bit more specific about the verbiage, right? Like actually asking for or stating for what you want to see uh, is a way to invite people and a way to inspire kind of development in a direction that you want to go. And so I won't read all these, but it'll be part of the final report in, in greater detail. So then Smart Pain Park, right? Smart Pain Park uh, actually is not really that broken, right? There's a lot of good things about Smart Pain Park. What we immediately took away when we started this project and what we always heard from the community was there's no real there there to Smart Pain Park, right? You're not you enter Samard Paint Park and there's that weird kind of ramp thing and an a outdoor electrical box and a birch tree that's struggling a little bit. And so there, there's no real like, I don't, I can't like, hey, meet me, you know, here at Samard Paint Park. There's no place to really meet someone. So there is that, but there is also connectivity as well as other program use. Like the conversation with some of the community was like, we come down for pickup soccer, I bring both my kids, the older one can play, the younger one doesn't have anything really to do. And so can we, can we look at having more diversity? We wanna keep the big central lawn because that's the lungs of Lewiston, but is there a way around the, the perimeter to start to activate that in a more meaningful way? And so that was really our recommendations was prog program, uh, as well as the there there and so you'll see in this image and some others of creating a uh, essentially a civic pavilion a multi-scale civic pavilion so something small that can have the puppet show you know on on saturday afternoons or something much larger for balloon fest or other large venues and so we interviewed a lot of the event managers and conversations about what their needs were and so in that plan You'll see that, um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, Beach Street becoming a regularized road rather than the gravel drive once you cross, providing parking, perpendicular parking along Beach Street, and then a, a, essentially a generous 10 to 12 foot wide sidewalk that would allow secondary emergency vehicles to park up on there during events. Using Oxford as a, like a stopgap or release valve for larger events and their ability to portage, if you will, uh, materials across the canal. And lastly, the canals themselves. This was the hardest one to clearly identify, but you know, this is a perspective along um, Canal Street looking southerly. Idea of giving Canal Street a road diet. Canal Street is essentially the back door in many ways, which is unfortunate because it's also the prime real estate if you think about it. The canals, as a, if you think about the canal as an asset rather than um, uh, the kind of overground edge that it is now. And so by giving Canal Street a road diet, encouraging development on the uphill side of Canal and creating a pedestrian prom along the canal. And the couple things that does is removes, removes the curb for far enough away from the canal that the barriers can be removed. It also creates essentially public realm along the canal and, and accentuates them as, as, a, as a amenity rather than the kind of overgrown condition they are. The other part that was part of the master plan or the vision plan was to think about a pilot project. And so this is just a quick study of Oxford Street. And one of the, well, I don't have the existing section here, but right now, as you know, the, I'll say the canal walls are about four feet tall. And part of the problem um, around the canals is if somebody falls in, they can't really, you can't get out and, or at least easily get out. And so, um, they're kind of considered to be a danger, right? They're a danger and fenced off and how to keep people away from them. And so part of the pilot project is to think about, is there a way in which we can create steps, terraces down to the canal? Not that we're gonna touch the water, but to provide a nearly touch the water experience, right? So that we can have the canal be part of, of your day-to-day -day existence. And you don't, you see it a little bit in this rendering. We cropped off the right side of Samard Paint Park, but 
you can see the steps going down to the canal on the right side in, in the full rendering, it really changes the character and the dynamic of Samard Payne Park. All of a sudden, Samard Payne Park now has like a front door or a front porch onto the city rather than always feeling like the canal is a barrier. And so our objective was how can we make the canal feel like an integrated part of the solution? And, and we think these steps in whatever form they provide allow that to happen because one can essentially easily get out, freezes in the winter, great opportunity for uh, hockey or skating. We're not going to, I can never remember the name of the term in the Netherlands where the canals freeze and everybody goes crazy and they all skate around the entire country. We're not promoting that necessarily, but there is an opportunity to have, you know, winter events down on the canals as well. So that was a glimpse of the vision plan. Um, there was a thousand other ideas that didn't make it through the filter. Um, but, and there's ideas that did that you didn't see uh, here tonight that'll be a, a part of the final package. All right. So. Uh, implementation project. So uh, Heather uh, essentially spearheaded this uh, every meeting uh, to her credit would be like, all right, so what are we, how are we going to do this? Like, these are all great ideas. How do we implement these? Can you give us a priority list? Like, what are we doing? And so we essentially, uh, we simplified this matrix. We had it much larger, but we, we tried to highlight uh, and give criteria to the different projects. And so we distilled each area down to about five projects that we felt rose to the top. There's others, um, but again, like we didn't want this to be a 400 page laundry list of things that you could you know, get lost in the weeds on. And so, and then we gave them um, priorities or weights based on land ownership, right? Does the city own it? Do they need to own it? Or is it privately owned and there requires the ability to essentially negotiate? Uh, how much is it going to cost? How technically challenging is it, right? If, if we're building the Eiffel Tower on top of Mill 5, that's pretty technical. If we're just, you know, taking some parking spaces to make bike lanes, that's way less technical. Um, and then um, the other two were um, how immediately impactful were they? Like, is it a bright, shiny object that everybody's going to love? And or does it open the door? Does it unlock the box for something else? And so we started to give weight to all these, started to give uh, early action or mid-range or long-term uh, implementation goals. And we um, went through each of the projects and each of the initiation initiatives and identified uh, the weighting associated with those. I won't go through those. Those are all in your, your calendar or in your packet. But we essentially then, um, took each initiative and highlighted, I'm going to say two, like two early action. What we're saying, at least in our, uh, from our uh, bleacher seats, what we think would be priority projects. And so the next slides you're going to see just as a roadmap, the bright arrow, the red arrow shows what, what we're talking about within the, right, the box on the upper left is a, is a screenshot essentially of the matrix, right? So you have the arrow, what we're talking about. So in this page, we're talking about extending the river walk to the south. And then you can see on the plan, highlighted in the gold or yellow, is the extent of that project scope. You can also see uh, the other areas, like 103 is the extending it further to the south. Um, and so you'll see a lot of information on here. But what we're really talking about, at least now, is what we're recommending the areas in the, in the gold box. So one of the primary uh, uh, initiatives, uh, at least in our mind, is making the river walk more, right? And that idea of build it and they will come, it's not quite a destination yet. It doesn't, you know, it's a great amenity, but it's not really getting me from anywhere, nor is it necessarily providing me kind of a tour of the city. It's just a small stretch. And so the more we can make the river walk as a real amenity, i.e. length, and taking in some, uh, I'll say some opportunities, uh, I think the stronger the Lewiston will be and the stronger the river walk will be. So first recommendation is extending it to the south uh, all the way across uh, Cedar Street. Cedar Street provides some challenges, as we know. The important thing, at least in our mind, about Cedar Street is its future connection up to Lincoln and the potential rail trail connection out along the rail tracks to the south. And so not only do we kill one bird of improving the harbor, harbor walk, Riverwalk, but also providing that future connection up to up to Lincoln Street as well. And so Cedar seems to be the, I'll say, the unlocking of the box for that. Right now, Cedar Street has bike lanes, 
uh, not buffered, right? It's a pretty, uh, pretty fast and car centric uh, condition. And so our proposal is to think about either there's a couple options we're looking at maintaining the bike lanes and, and introducing in that buffer, sorry, to the north uh, along Continental Mill, a multi-use path, essentially a shared bike pedestrian experience. There's not a lot of storefront, if any, along there. And so it seems like a safe place to have that combined experience. And so along the river walk to essentially extend along Cedar up to the existing crossing, making the crossing more visible, and then extending uh, the river walk across into the existing park. Some programming uh, program elements may need to shift in the park to the south, uh, but really making that a viable connection. We looked at crossing immediately along the river. There's just a lot of sight line issues coming across the bridge. And so getting up to the existing crossing was originally the right idea. And we support that right idea of that quote unquote mid block crossing uh, between the river and Lincoln Street. The other project that we think is a priority is the connection to Veterans Park, right? Of making, and that's a, again, killing a couple birds, of making Island Point better connected, but also extending the river walk underneath uh, Main Street Bridge. And so our firm is working on a, a water main project. And so the hope is that uh, we, can, we can have a both and, we can provide construction access to that, um, to the water main that's going underneath the bridge and also providing that access as a future essentially based or ballast for uh, a river walk to extend below uh, the bridge, very similar to what happens on the Auburn side. And what's even better is then the connection, I'll say better than the Auburn side, the connection to Island Point, Veterans Park, Islands Point, and, and points beyond. And if we're, if we're crazy, talking about getting some sort of grand bridge across the Great Falls to make an amazing loop on the R Lewiston Auburn uh, River Trail, but we'll, that's a low, that's a long-term vision, <laughs> long-term vision. And so the, just a quick highlight, you know, of what we're talking about there of getting that underpass, if that becomes problematic, either through permitting or cost, we're also uh, working with the city about looking at ways in which there could be a surface crossing of main street. It's really problematic with that right hand, uh, slip lane. Um, but again, uh, there could be opportunities to explore that as well. The other part, uh, which is falls into the low hanging fruit category is uh, improving the bike connections. There's some really easy solutions that can be implemented to make the bike network uh, more robust than what it is now. Moving on to Island Point, um, really there's two priorities in our minds around Island Point. One is uh, we struggled with this term, but the idea of, of being proactively thinking about uh, land right of ways easements, whatever it might be within Island Point. You can see in the plan on the right that those purple areas are land owned by the city already. The yellow area in that black highlight um, in 203 is land that is not, but seems critical for the future of Island Point. Again, whether that's city acquisition, we're not promoting that. We're just saying there should be thought around how that occurs, primarily Mill Street's connection and linking it back to the south side of, uh, of Main Street, um, creating an easement or corridor to allow Mill Street to come across and, and essentially head to uh, the Great Falls and what we see as hospitality or, or parking opportunities there at the end. <clears throat> and then as we talked, all these ideas around uh, this yin and yang of Samar Paint Park and Island Point and creating zoning that would allow that, and again, apologize, Emily's not here, uh, and I won't read these in great detail, but it's really about one, creating maybe a special zoning district around Island Point to help flexibility. The other is to be a little bit more specific about our aspirations within the zoning, literally within the terminology of the zoning. And again, Emily has, in this report, our, our master plan will provide a full kind of list of recommendations around the zoning. But the idea is to allow and entice and encourage uh, those opportunities to happen at, at Island Point. Um, the next uh, around implementation uh, around the infill projects is really uh, about the zoning. Um, the current uh, zoning, uh, oops, wrong way. The current zoning uh, within the infill district um, is, at the time it was written, seems to be a little bit density adverse. 
primarily around uh, this example. So there's one, um, can every name, the minimum net lot area per dwelling. Essentially, there's a, if you have a lot that's 1,250 square feet, you can have one unit. If you have a lot that's 2,500, you can have two units, you can't, but you can't have anything more than that. So if your lot area is, again, right, is the number of units you have is limited by the lot area. And so you can see these two examples. If you keep the current zoning on, on a lot of that size, which is this made, made, made believe lot in which we consolidated a bunch of parcels, you can basically get a hundred, or oh, sorry, hundred, you can get a one and a half story building. Um, you can get around 37 units within that in its current zoning, which isn't a lot. It's hard for a developer to come in and, and see a lot of uh, value on the investment in a one and a half story development. Um, whereas if you just simply changed that one, um, uh, one requirement, not that you would allow this to happen, but um, you could essentially uh, build up to five, six stories. You could build up to your maximum height. You could build up to your lot coverage. All the other kind of zoning guidelines and requirements could be met or at least uh, met up to or at least tested. Uh, but with this one net lot size, none of that kind of zoning is, is even coming close, right? So your maximum height of 77 feet isn't really a, a valuable zoning uh, criteria because of the minimum lot size. You'll never even get close to 77 feet as the maximum height within this area. And so there's a slew of recommendations, this one being one of the primary ones. And really it's about encouraging density in an area that the community seems to be interested in density. Um, and then lastly, uh, or last two, Smart Paint Park, uh, looking at one, the, the pavilion, and to uh, making Beach Street into a real street. Right now with Museum LA, other development looking to happen down along the river, Beach Street becoming a real right of way to allow emergency vehicles, to allow access, allow parking for Samaritan Art Paint Park. And then obviously the conversation prior is about this community pavilion we're recommending as a priority uh, project to really kind of cement Smart Paint Park as a civic location. And then lastly, uh, the canals, uh, and so we'll touch briefly on the pilot project. Um, we're, look, we're recommending that um, the Oxford Street Canal along Samard Paint Park become the pilot project. Um, and the idea is you know, creating, one, removing the barriers, um, two, uh, creating those steps uh, down along the Samard Paint Park side, but then also some public realm improvements along the Oxford Street side um, giving it a little bit of road diet. Right now it's 14 foot lanes and some parking. It's very uh, nondescript in its uh, circulation corridor. So increasing the public uh, sidewalk along the canal side and then creating these small overlook moments uh, which allow people to get out and overlook the canal. They're not big game changers, but it does make the canal part of the everyday vocabulary of pedestrians within Lewiston. And so just, you know, we've recommended some materials, some imagery, uh, some lighting, had conversations with uh, the city about um, where we use standard lighting and where we can start to look at maybe some pedestrian scale lighting to help accentuate some pri primary areas uh, for pedestrian gathering. And then so this is just that canal, that study of this is the existing conditions and the idea of by reducing or encouraging the steps, we're now able to provide access in ways that we haven't uh, in the past. So that was way, <laughs> I say this every time I'm here, that was way longer than I wanted to go, so I apologize for that. Um, but really, that's, that's, uh, that was a lot of work we've been doing, and, it, and that was um, a big nutshell, but that was uh, some of the visioning that we've been doing over the last, um, it's almost been a year um, here in Lewiston. So happy to take questions. I know staff is here as well to take questions. And again, um, very casual. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Lucy, um, can, but can you use your mic? Uh, yeah, I have a, a comment. Sorry, uh, Chair Bisson. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> I understand that you, you've used a certain scale to, to rate when are the long term, the short term. The, my problem is I see where you have the uh, Ash Street corridor as a long term, yeah. and on you know on, I disagree. Yeah, 
I believe that that should be a, as early as possible. I, I'm not saying it has to be, you know, the first thing, but it has to be early because if you want to get people down to the river, down to Lincoln Street, down to the park, you have to have a way for them to get from Ash Street to Lincoln Street because they're not going to walk from Cedar to Main Street or vice versa to get around there. It's, it's just way too far. And if you want people like me, old people, to be you know, able to do it, they're definitely not going to be walking that far. Yeah, I, so I mean. That, that's my comment. Yeah, again, I, I, I hope I qualified our, our strategies like from our bleacher seats. You know, that's what we were recommending. And, and again, like we love all of our children equally. And so we like all of these ideas. We were just trying to find, and again, tonight is exactly the, the forum in which to have that conversation. So I know staff is obviously here and listening, and so we can have that conversation about moving that up and, and ways to make it maybe more manageable, right, as a solution. Uh, Councilor Peace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just have a couple of statements. One is uh, I think you did an absolute phenomenal job on this presentation forum. Uh, a lot of information there, a lot of it I really like, uh, especially when you uh, highlighted some of the other towns that have done similar things. Uh, my wife and I have always said that you know, we needed to do something down there. Um, my thing is, is coming back to a couple of questions of one of them on the canal where mill number five is, I, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't even know if this is relevant right now, but. They have a, a foundation problem, mill number five, that abuts the canal. Um, is something looked into where they could put like a culvert type system there and bury a section of that canal, where instead of trying to re rebuild the uh, mill number five's foundation, uh, I don't know if that was ever brought up. Um, I like the idea of uh, being able to have skating there uh, being able to control the water uh, on height, depth, so that to make it safer for in the winter time, for if kids do go on it before it's completely frozen, they're not going to drown. They'll get wet. Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing is on the bike paths. Uh, I'm sure you must have uh, touched base with Maine Bike Coalition in referencing to how many bikes are in the area, how many people are interested in coming in there, uh, is there a, a thought of other towns wanting their bikers to come down and do you know, trail rides and this type of thing? Uh, so I'm sure that has been touched, right? <laughs> uh, I know Shelley has reached out to... Um, we did take this plan to the Complete Streets Committee and had a robust conversation with them about it. They actually had made a recommendation on Canal Street originally. We were showing a bike lane going in one direction. And based on the network of um, connectivity downtown, they recommended it go two-way so that there would be greater ability. Um, there were limitations on the, sorry, the which is east and west and which is north south north is towards <laughs> north, south, south, west. <laughs> in the north south um they they felt like there wasn't a lot of southern directional um connectivity so they they wanted that to go two ways so um that was their recommendation uh certainly there was a lot of discussion with that group about the discomfort a lot of people have with biking let's say on Lincoln Street for example even though there are bike lanes they aren't protected and so to really get people using bikes in the downtown more consistently there needs to be that network um, we've certainly talked with Halverson and Public Works has had conversations and we're looking at um, some studies going forward with Main Street and how to then continue that connectivity across Main Street because we know that that's a, a problem right now. Um, so we have looked at that. Uh, certainly there's also a great interest in being able to um, have that bike connectivity across the bridge with Auburn so that people can really go across the pedestrian bridge and really go from one downtown to the other on a bike safely. So. It's what we've looked at. Well, this is why I asked the question, only because I know how informative they are and how much they've been involved with all these bikers from all over the state. 
yep. and how involved they are with it. Uh, so I thought they would be a good source. Mm. Uh, the only other thing is uh, if we could take the lower canal, and this is just a thought off the top of my head, if we could take the lower canal and connect it to the river by a way of, uh, we'll say, uh, rapids towards the river so that uh, people that like white water rafting, they can canal, use the canal for one thing, and if they want to do a little bit of white water, they can go in and they can go all the way down to the river for it and then canoe or whatever from there. Uh, that's the only other thing I have, and I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, well, we're going to uh, uh, heard from a couple, um, or heard from, well, we've heard from, oh, we've heard, we have heard from a, sorry, <laughs> we've heard from one of each, so at this point, yeah, Linda Scott. Thank you. So, also, phenomenal job. Um, and I was going to ask, did the planning board get a copy of this big, I think that the planning board should have Maybe a copy email, of this. but not hard. Okay, I, 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 if we can, I don't know if that's possible. I know it's a lot of paper, but it is really easier because the first time I read it was online also. And getting this was extremely helpful. So I think I'd like to have that happen if we can. That we had this whole report on all the comments too. Thank you. I mean, this was a phenomenal job putting this all together. Um, I would have to concur with Chair Bisson that that connection piece from Ash Street down is one of the things that I hear discussed constantly, especially when we're having events down in Smart Pain Park, and then we have our local artisans and those that want to do like a pop-up art thing on Lisbon Street at the same time. How do we connect those sorts of things? And I think any sort of event that we're going to be doing, we can really build on that event. When we had the trek downtown, that was another conversation that came up. We had closed that part of Lisbon Street, and a lot of those trekkers were talking about how do we get from here to there point without having to go through all the traffic. So I would concur that that's a pretty important piece. Um, I think that when we look at some of the early stuff that you posted, a pavilion, another huge piece in my opinion. When we look at the events that happen at Smart Pain Park and we look at that little thing with the ramp, that <laughs> thing, yeah. and you see people that like at our World Refugee Day and, and at some of the other events trying to set up there is a really difficult thing. So if that's something that we could focus on sooner rather than later, I think that's really going to bring the potential of the use of that park up for other events and make it more of a place to go and gather. And then um, the zoning. I'd really like to see why don't we start looking at it and tackling it. It's, it's one of those things we can at least start the conversation and get that moving towards on that point and then we can go from there. And the important piece here is that, you know, if we're going to do something like this, and this is a huge change for our community this could be potentially a huge boost we need to ensure that not just the folks that all went to the you know and commented and all that but our whole community is getting this and understanding the investment that's going to be needed to do this so when we're talking budget season and we're talking some of these changes we really got to be all on the same page and pushing forward that this is this is an important piece in moving our city forward and again thank you yeah thank you uh were there uh, comments from the staff or administration? Because uh, we talked, to, or you had discussed the 5.01 pilot project, Oxford Street and Lower Canal. Um, you know, in my mind, the the pilot project uh, something that could be easily doable very soon. Or wh wh what are thoughts on that? That's why we identified one project that we could use. To your point, as the the pilot project or the showcase or the kickoff to this plan. We did include some money in the LCIP um, for the kickoff project. We would need to get it designed and kind of refine that estimate of what that pilot project looks like. But that is the intention. That we could get started on it fairly soon, Correct. pending approval and everything. Yep. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Member Cox. <laughs> I'd just like to echo my appreciation for this plan and uh, that your priorities were the ones I would have picked out of the gate too. Um, there's a couple of notes, but I'll, two that I'll bring forward and maybe I can reserve any for after everyone else has had a chance to speak. But um, I couldn't appreciate more um, the comments around biking that Councillor Pease brought up and that were echoed by Councillor Scott. Um, I, in the context of the tension that you all held creating this plan in regards to 
it being clearly an economic development plan that values, creates space for, and prioritizes physical space for civic engagement, community building. Um, it sometimes feels like, not necessarily in your plan, but in the way we as community leaders talk about those options, priorities, that they are competing and that, that there is not this kind of magical space where they come together. So I wanted to lift up a couple clearly that the the comments around bike and any of the implementation activities related to increased bike connectivity, biker safety, the movement and flow of pedestrians in any type of um, bike, ped, or related wheels um, that, that might bring people around. I'm thinking, you know, strollers and, and all of the activities. Um, I would just name that we have two two bike shops that have grown significantly in business. We have the Dempsey Challenge that has created a culture of biking. We've seen the expansion of that economic activity and business activity. One of those um, businesses leads a kind of inner city trek annually, which is, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the implementation of these pieces. And so I just think that oftentimes we can talk about biking as like that being nice for people who don't have cars or folks who, who are trying to be healthy, but there is a significant destination place making economic impact attached to those priorities. And so I wanted to lift that up as it being a very sweet spot around economic activity, increased tax revenue, retail revenue, business activity related to those events, and that that implementation of that is not just about connectivity, but the economic impact that that connectivity creates. Um, that felt like a pretty important one. And then the only thing that feels like it's missing <laughs> is um, related to 3.01 that you have named and which, as a planning board member, we have some interest in, um, which is revising zoning yep. to to really speak to the live section in that kind of spacing and organizing of the plan. And I, I really love that that's called out as both the economic opportunity, the market demand, and the space in the plan. I'm going to boldly say this to our um, council and administration, as well as my, my planning board members and colleagues. Um, you talk about revising zoning and flexibility and density for residential development. We talk in other areas about the cost of plans and the investments that we might allocate or need to rally support around from residents. Um, I would just name, I would be intrigued to know if like a 3.01B could potentially exist where there is, and we recently had a presentation at, at planning board, I think there's been discussion at council, what would it look like for a program that invests in incentivizing housing right. and density in that identified area? What would that look like in addition to the other kind of hard costs, like we put in pavement or trees or steps, or what would it look like for us to put some financial incentive, and this goes to your points around opportunities for clear messaging and inviting people in, but I think that there could be some financial investment in incentivizing that supports what those revised zoning does and that achieves that live banner across the, the section. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, again, I apologize that Emily's not here. She speaks better to it and probably would have hit that a little bit more. Um, uh, yes so it's not it's not it's not only the zoning but what economic opportunities and what feedback have they gotten from Emily and and our KG group about their correspondence with some of the stakeholders right it's, it's sometimes it seems really transparent and clear how to bring development in to Lewiston other times other developers have met with confusion and whatnot and so just having those conversations I think she's uh, hoping to sit down with staff to have more conversations about what have people seen as the roadblocks, how can we find incentives? You know, we're not giving away the farm, but how can we make it be a win-win for everybody? And I think, you know, I'll just say personally, there's been a lot of, uh, one point I did make is as Portland and other cities, Portsmouth, other cities become economically uh, challenging for development, Lewiston, Auburn, like all these kind of sister cities seem, are really starting to shine in a lot of ways and there's, I think there's an idea that there's some good momentum right now to capture that. So agreed. Member Neji. Um, I'd like to first echo pretty much what everybody else has said. Um, it, it is a is a, a large and daunting plan. Um, 
a lot of good pieces to it. Um, one point I'd like to bring up is I can't stress enough the importance of connectivity um, to place. And there are, exi like when you talk about missing teeth, there are actually several thriving businesses and also cultural points that if we tie them together correctly, um, you'd be amazed at the amount of people who go eat at Da Vinci's, get in their car, and then drive to Gendron, uh, to the Franco Center, yeah. right? Like, that should be a walkable experience yeah. um, because it's only, it's literally 500 feet away. Yeah. <laughs> so thinking about ways to connect those places and also support, um, you know, we, we've got uh, Fishbones down there, we've got Baxter's, and it may not be immediately uh, apparent to the to the people who live in this community but and I think it was like on page 72 or 73 there was like a throwaway comment that was like you know um, uh, due to the lack of, of, of higher education in the community you can be the smartest person in the room I'm paraphrasing but, but <laughs> like basically 9,000 people come into this town every day um, and work here um, they don't necessarily eat here they don't necessarily spend their leisure time here so we build it for ourselves, but we also build it for the people who um, who frequent our community and are present from seven to three or nine to five. Um, and so, um, I think it's it's an important thing, to, you know. Again, that that connectivity piece, and then and thinking about how we support things that are already here. Um, and I just want to also say, when when I read like the meandering path section, it is really concerning to me that we have a lot of meandering paths. <laughs> like you want to be able to go from one place to another place. Like it has to be purposeful. Right? Yeah, I think that was more about the Riverwalk specifically. Like the desired feedback we got from the community was that the Riverwalk should be about the journey and the, the quote unquote connect, right? The urban grid streetscape connections are that like point A to point B, right? Those should be pleasant experiences around ground floor retail, street trees, et cetera, to make those walks from Da Vinci's to the Franco Center, like part of your daily existence, right? So the meandering through the city, not necessarily the meandering through the river walk, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Member Pine. Thanks. Um, just to tag on to all the comments about, you know, infrastructure surrounding transportation, you know, people on, on feet, people on bike. Um, super important for economic development you know i i could probably go through my uh my own personal bank account and identify the days that i was riding my bike because i spend like twice as much on food because i'll ride past a restaurant and then turn around and go back and get some takeout or something um so that's all very important one thing i'd love to see in the the final report i don't know if it's going to be incorporated is if there are opportunities with any of these to either do them in a in a phased um, way or you know for example and I'm just sort of making this up so maybe it, it doesn't hold true but for example for the river walk instead of having you know work where we clear the land you know do all the grading put in a pa hard paved path put in all of the you know benches and nice lights and all of these things maybe we start with just clearing it and having a hard packed dirt path at first right allowing for projects that have um you know the ability to sort of do a a test run you know you're maybe we don't rebuild uh oxford street to be you know smaller travel lanes you know uh different style of parking more street trees maybe we put planters in first to reduce that travel lane size try it out see if it works for size or or, or works for that area uh before we commit or to a, a full rebuild or you know so we don't end up in a cycle of well we don't have the resources for it this year we can't do the big thing so we're we're going to push it off another year being able to do these small incremental things allows us to learn more about how the larger project's going to go but then also can give the community some of that immediate benefit uh at a much lower cost you know is it perfect no um, but at the same time, you know, cities don't happen overnight. They're organic. They're living things. And so, you know, giving the plant a little plant food instead of just dumping it all on um, isn't always a bad approach. Yeah, that's a really good point. And also, I mean, we found 
tactics like that also then when there's project improvements or another piece of a parcel adjacent to the quote unquote pop-up solution comes online like there's a there's an incentive for that either a developer or whomever right to start making that a more realized long-term solution and so I think you know it starts with plans like this in which we identify the alignment or the locations there's small interjections that occur I mean I think the connection along the depot it really doesn't go from anywhere but it, it right it started to instigate some thought around development and expansion and connectivity so agree 100 percent if there's will will help to identify places that there may be a pop-up or smaller kind of interventions that can start as a catalyst as well. Uh, Councilor Jolinas. Thank you. Um, thanks for this work. This is really exciting. And, um, you know, I really love the decision matrix that was put in there. <laughs> that was Heather's work. But, you know, the timeline that really outlines, you know, monetary as well as different um, you know, just monetary and, and timeline decisions, I think. So I think that's great. That was really helpful to, to look at. Um, you know, as a road cyclist myself, I'm going to jump on the, the biking uh, support train for a minute. I really appreciate the work that the city's already done. I mean, I will tell you that I feel very comfortable cycling across Lone Bridge, and certainly more work needs to be done on other bridges. But I'd love to see sort of like more bike paths around the canal, kind of like what Lisbon has on their river, you know, like an ability to just bike along those canals and, and do more of that. Um, so hearing you talk about, you know, a bike network that's more robust is, is, is excellent. Um, you know, the canal revitalization, um, I love that. I think that's such an asset to the city, but the fencing thing comes up for me a lot. I think about that safety, um, you know, and I know that there's, you know, tall fences and stuff, but in the plan, you know, there was some talk about, um, I heard you mention something about, um, Upgrading the fencing so that you know there'd be better visibility of the canals yep. for sure. Getting rid of all the you know tuck of brush or whatever you want to call it, but I think that you know also just from a safety perspective because I think that's an important thing when you think about cars coming down um, that way. And I, just having lived here my whole life, uh, <laughs> yep. hearing stuff. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, when I think about Samard Payne, you talked about a adventure play space, and, and, I, and I love that idea because, um, like you mentioned earlier, you can go down there and play soccer or, or whatever, but I mean, beyond that, there's a lot of great space, but I think, um, you know, City of Lewiston developed the first universally accessible playground at Jude's, Jude's, uh, Jude's Place, I guess it's called, right? It would be great to see something like that and go up again in that area because, you um, you know, I, I uh, work with children who have developmental disabilities, and I hear about that park all the time. And it's just one location in Maine, but it's really well received. And I think if we're going to consider a, an adventure play space, I would just ask that some consideration be made toward, toward it being universally accessible. Um, and I think the last thing, and I guess you mentioned this a little bit, but, you know, I think about that area and the revitalization of that area, and the other thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, sculptures for sure, artwork, lighting, but all of that just to create better ambiance, so. Yep, yep. That's it. I, I mean, uh, I joke that we love all of our children equally. The, the simple task of removing the pioneer plants uh, or invasive you know, along the canal, getting yeah. better fencing, like just making the canals a visible part of the infrastructure of the city. I think that would be, I, I would have argued that should rise to, the, to the, the higher platform. My peers didn't necessarily in my office, but I think that's an easy move that can happen incrementally. And also the, the thinking about the canal, its distance from the roadway, the idea that Canal Street itself could become a pedestrian prom. I think there's some great opportunities because that's actually one of the loveliest spots in Lewiston is standing. You can't tell it now, but like you got the mills in the foreground, this land sloping down, you get the sunset, you know, in the distance. It's really remarkable. And so we feel like, you know, Canal Street is one of the one of the great assets that we don't probably didn't talk about it enough in this plan. And so I think that'll be part of our narrative is, is the importance of Canal Street. So, agreed. Councillor La Chapelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just would echo a few concerns or just <coughs> express a few concerns. This, this project is not just for um, the people downtown. The whole key is to draw everybody to that. 
we have two of our major corridors that have met by Canal Street. And we have to be careful. One of the frustrating things for me is we get to it and all of a sudden becomes a bottleneck and nobody wants to try it. So we said we're going to put it on a diet, or I don't know the terminology on it. Yeah, um, and we're, we're very concerned on pedestrian flow. Agreed. I'm still concerned on vehicle flow to allow the people to get down there to, to, to flow, to get down to the Canal Street parking garage, and just to be able to move around. And all of a sudden, if we go down to one lane, it's bumper to bumper. It's, a, it's, it's difficult to navigate. So I just want to just echo just a voice of caution of not just just shrinking it, saying we need one lane, so we need 15 feet for bikes and 45 feet for tents, and uh, it's, I know I'm exaggerating, but just keep that in mind. The other thing would be for, um, and, and great job on the time frame, is as we move forward and really start to focus on the time frame on what we're looking at. Because this is going to, I've had the pleasure to speak to multiple developers um, throughout Lewiston, and they have plans that are coming in that they're looking at and saying, okay, if you're doing this here, this ties in perfect if I'm looking to build this here. But it, it's, it's almost a, a matching project. So if you don't build that, I don't know if I really want to build that housing unit. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really critical for us on both sides, both boards, to try to stick to some game plan and attack all the low-hanging fruit as much as possible, clearing the shrubs away from the, the... We don't have to put new fencing up because fencing is really expensive. But what can we do that's going to be great impact, little cost? Um, and the gentleman at the end, I'm sorry, I don't know, um, a good comment on just trying different sections and, and trying to work that out. That, that was a great comment. So uh, for me, Traffic, flow traffic, pattern of people coming in and out. When you have the, um, the balloon festival, when you have drawing that people to that crowd, you've got to have room for vehicles to get there because the majority of the people are coming by vehicles. Um, so thank you. Uh, before we um, uh, recognize people who have already spoken, is there anyone who hasn't spoken uh, at this point who now would like? Uh, yes. Um, Member Smith. Hi, thanks again. It's a great plan. Mm -hmm. Very you. exciting stuff. Um, I, I'm also all about the biking and the connectivity. I think it's so important to get people down to the river. I also think it's important to get people onto the river. And so um, one, of the, one of the projects in here was sort of a boat pavilion. For a little while in the summer, we have some rowing stuff going on down there, and people have brought kayaks and asked if they could store them you know, near the boats. And so I think another really cool thing would be to get, to your point, Alex, some sort of small pilot going um, where we do have secure storage for small boats, kayaks, paddle boards down by the river because if you can store your stuff down there, then you can very easily get out on the water. And it, when that water has boats on it of whatever type, it's, it feels really exciting. So just anything that we can do to sort of get things onto the water easily for people, I think is also super helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, well, uh, Councillor Pease. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I also wanted to comment on your uh, thought about putting hot pack dirt versus pavement and all everything else that goes along with it. And a prime example of that is Lisbon. Lisbon's Trail, they started off, uh, they had just a dirt path. Then they made it wide enough for a couple of bikes to go by. Now it's almost like a little roadway and it's traveled all the time. And they did that in steps. And they only went, I think it was a mile or so, and then they were three miles and it's six miles. And I was like, it's almost a Brunswick, isn't it now? Um, so I think that's a great idea to start small, look <coughs> into it, Cost effectively is it's going to cost us less in the long run. We don't have to expend the monies all in one shot, uh, we and we can tackle other areas at the same time by saving some money on the front. Thank you, Councillor Herman. Thank you. Um, as others have said, thank you for this this great report. Um, 
Councillor Pease reminded me of the, um, the potential for connecting to a future bike and ped trail uh, that would head out towards Lisbon. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for that if we could, um, as a city, maybe start, start looking into um, how we can make that happen. Um, I mean, <coughs> even just, I know it would, it would probably require some cooperation with Lisbon if they were to um, maybe acquire their portion of the, of the rail line and then we could connect into Lisbon's trail. Um, and that could be a, just a huge draw, um, not just for people in Lewiston, but to draw people into Lewiston for events. Um, so I'd just like to put a plug in for that trail. Thanks. Uh, Member Najin. Um, just real quick, as everybody was talking, I started to think about the fact that several of the people who are on the council and uh, zoning have, and actually the administrator and deputy administrator have been involved in planning uh, for events in this city and how um, uh, space, uh, multi-use multi space, like building up placemaking in locations where you can easily plug into something, where you can easily access, uh, 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 you know, um, water, things like that. There's a, there's, there, there are a lot of um, small ventures in this community where people are willing to put in the work and make something happen in order to bring people into downtown, providing that the infrastructure exists. And in, in this rebuild, I think thinking about a couple of those spaces in order to make sure that they are able to be place making spaces where you say to yourself, I wonder what's going on down there Thursday. You know, uh, I think it's uh, I, I think it'd be valuable. Member Cox. I would like to bring this up and it feels like a bit of a third rail. So I apologize in advance. I'm gonna to try to frame this in the form of a question for perhaps you and the rest of us. Um, there was a number of points in the plan and which you have heard many of us have some, some like exciting strong reactions to around the connectivity with Ash Street, um, around your uh, multi-layer elevated pedestrian connection um, through through the parcel from Canal to Lincoln as somebody who's responsible for organizing some of the events that you've you've heard about tonight um, you know we try really hard to work with our downtown businesses to ensure that anything we're doing on the waterfront is is driving people to lunch on Lisbon Street and to go get a cocktail after the go catch a comedy show we really try hard and the reality is it's like physically very challenging to move people of their own accord or with fantastic signage from one space to the other. And um, here's the question. Uh, what is the way that this city and its decision-making bodies could coalesce around a vision for Bates Mill number five and its impact to accelerate or prevent some of what we've heard here as priorities? Uh, uh, I'll I'll speak briefly, like it, from our point of view, like mill five is a great asset, right? And, but it is that barrier and it does have some structural integrity issues. Obviously it's old. Um, so, I mean, we've put forth a couple of ideas how to make that connectivity. A lot of it, it's privately owned. So there's some obstacles there, which, you know, we, we acknowledge, um, from our point, there's got to be a solution. I don't think making a culvert over the canal is a solution, but there is the ability to essentially you could span it with members and then only deck a certain part of it. So, you know, in the vein of the conversations tonight, if there is actual connectivity and pedestrian activity that happens along the face and around Mill 5, that may encourage Mill 5 to become an active uh, programmatic use. That would be our hope to help encourage that. Like, obviously, we can't control that. You, you you all have more kind of ability to at the reins around that, but our aspiration would be to provide the connectivity to encourage Mill 5 to become a, a programmatic um, event, retail, hospitality, office, whatever you know environment it, it becomes. I know that's not really an answer, but. That's why it was directed towards you and yeah, the rest of us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just, if I could follow up, just some of the plans um, either assume that there is site access and a high level in confidence that the structure will exist 
for us to attach things to, move people around, incorporate, and some of those are early priorities. And, and this community and all of us who have been engaged in those conversations for 10, 15, many more, I'm sure, years, um, the confidence level about being able to build with, build around, or demolish and build through, like there is always a pendulum swift of public and decision-making opinions on where that lands. And if we're going to prioritize connectivity physically, bike, ped, cars, I don't know, all of the movement that we would need to make any of this really have the catalyst impact that we'd want to see, um, it, it just requires a level of confidence in a direction with no comment in this moment about what that direction should be. It's hard to get private developers. It's hard to make public investment if we don't have a high level of confidence about what direction we're headed in and the importance of that specific linchpin piece to the whole picture across a number of these areas feels like it's worth saying out loud and explicitly and saying what would it take for our two bodies and <coughs> our community to support a clear direction with confidence. Member Pine, did you want to weigh in? Not on uh, Member Cox's uh, question comment. Um, uh, I, sorry, I meant like Wayne in general. I oh, know you, I know you had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a uh, little little intersection here. I guess for for that, I wonder. Um, I think it is really smart to identify Mill Five as being sort of this this thing that a lot of stuff is either physically or emotionally or sort of you know structurally politically attached to. Um, I wonder, if, at least, you know, in the in the idea of a, a pedestrian connection, if there are alternatives to that, you know, bolting something onto the side of the the other mill on the other side of the canal there, <laughs> or going around Mill Five. You know, I think it's it's worth thinking about alternative solutions, even if they are longer distance wise. Uh, if they're more pleasant than Main Street, people will probably use them. Um, I was going to comment in about the concern around car space, and I think it is really important to realize that we still need to have um, the ability to attract people from outside the downtown area. I think that is incredibly important, and I think one of the wonderful things, you know, often it, there's concern when you hear road diet, we're going to get rid of lanes, we're going to make things smaller. But one of the interesting things about car travel is that you have this interesting relationship between speed and the amount of space taken up. In theory, we have unsafe drivers, but I'm not gonna go into that. But basically the idea is that, you know, as you slow down cars a little bit, it allows them to be a lot closer to each other in traffic. So you can actually fit more cars into a street that has slightly slower speed limits, um, which, you know, at least for me, you know, makes it easier to parallel park or pull into parking. I don't stress out as much that, you know, I'm gonna go flying past the place. So um, you know, a, a road diet shouldn't be seen as something that's there to punish a car. In fact, it's, it's supposed to also help make the driver's experience better. So, I, and I think from what I've seen talking with, with the landscape architecture firm, they are really interested in that. So I don't think it's getting abandoned and, and I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, I had another thing, but I've forgotten it and I should have written it down. Oh well. but. For Bates Mill number five, it is it is a big project. It's an expensive project. There's a lot moving there. So I wonder, you know, if there are these things that it gates, you know, let's maybe try to look at how we can get around that. What are some alternatives? Not to kick the football of mill number five further down the court, but you know, life's gotta move on. <laughs> some of uh so these don't, um, your presentation doesn't have page numbers, but I'm referring to, to this map yep. uh, of available properties. You know, and it's my understanding, uh, based on conversations that happened at the time, one of the reasons that we have uh, a downtown hotel, the Hampton Inn, is because we identified that as a need. So as we move forward in the project and we're talking about zoning and the infill that we want, I think it's important to highlight the types of businesses that we may want to fill this 
um, you know, just to really lead developers on. Um, you know, that's what happened with the hotel, and then it was almost like magic. We only have a hotel. And so if we identify the kinds of, um, you know, yes, restaurants, retails, but if we, uh, the more we are able to identify the kinds of businesses that we think will make sense here uh, and then clearly communicate that to developers, I, I think that's going to, um, you know, uh, things are going to happen. Yeah, and I think Emily would has supported that notion of, of the magic of terminology within the zoning, right, and the process and the, the planning and uh, process that economic development and planning is doing. Further comments from anyone? Councilor Pease. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I just want to make a comment about Lisbon Street. You know, we're talking about... Uh, revitalizing Lisbon Street. Uh, we've done that many, many times. Um, I think our biggest problem was years ago when we allowed uh, the development of the large big box malls, mall areas. And they took our businesses uh, from Lisbon Street and they brought them there. And uh, Lisbon Street went downhill, downhill, downhill all the way. I think we would have been wiser if we would have uh, helped these small businesses expand their business and help them in the area, they probably would have stayed here. Um, I think we need to look into see a, a, a way that we can probably bring some small businesses down on Lisbon Street and make it easy for them to get down here and affordable. Uh, once we get them on their feet, they're going to stay and they're going to thrive. But sometimes they need that little extra. And I think us as a city, we should look into trying to do something like that. Um, Planner Norton, is there anything that, uh, uh, I know you were busy taking notes, uh, uh, all of our amazing ideas, but is there uh, anything you'd like to uh, share at this point? Um, I know you were heavily involved in the process. Um, I guess I just wanted to provide one statement about MIL-5, <laughs> um, knowing that that is sort of a has been sort of an intractable problem um, to date. Uh, recently, and I can't speak for kind of everyone or where administration is on this, but at the staff level, we've been talking about doing some legwork to figure out if there's a way to uh, phase work there, you know. Um, replacing an entire roof is a lot of money. Is there a way to save some of the building, but not all of the building, or you know, do something a little more piecemeal? I think at this point, we don't have answers of feasibility for that question, but I think that that might be a direction um, that we're interested in exploring. So I don't know if that's the answer, but we recognize certainly that we're getting to a point where a decision needs to be made so that things can move forward. Uh, Councillor LaChapelle. Thank you. In my understanding, we can't even just tear it down right now. Right. It's going to millions of dollars has to go into it for cleanup. Uh, on a council level, we're going to continue to vote, well, whatever, for LCIP to, to start doing it. We have to do something about it. We've, we've ignored it year after year after year, so I, I agree. Um, some move, movement has to be made, to even just cleaning it. Once we clean up the mess, then you say, okay, do you tear it down or you do something with it? But you have to do that first. So um, I'm in hopes that this year in the LCIP that we dedicate some funds towards that. Um, but it's going to take some sacrifices. But every council and every planning board for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. 15 years, have been talking about it. <laughs> yeah. So we, we actually have to take some move, some action on it. Yeah. I agree 100%. Yeah. If I can just, uh, I, I think it was mentioned or, or at least implied that Mill 5 was uh, structurally unsound and that is um, not in fact the case. Yes, there is some work that needs to be done, but it is not um, uh, falling down nor, in, nor is in any danger of doing so. Yeah, I, I may have said that. My point was if we start cantilevering walkways or other things off of that, there's a whole engineering study that would need to happen. I can't support that the building would support uh, us doing that, but it is, it, it's an option we should potentially be looking at, so. 
Not turnkey, certainly. (laughs) (laughs) Is there anything that you'd like to add, um, uh, Director Hedegar? As Shelley mentioned at the beginning, um, Rob has some work to wrap this up into a shiny uh, package for us. We'll be going to the planning board probably the end of March, beginning of April, for a recommendation to adopt it as an amendment to the comp plan and the plan itself, and then it would come forward to you folks. You folks are going to be dealing with the budget here shortly, and every year we've put money in, and every year the council has been great as far as um, Riverfront uh, master plan implementation, but you'll see that in there. So, um, you know, with the matrix that um, you folks have here, just to keep that in mind as far as, you know, what can we do for low hanging fruit? What can we do in the next, you know, 12 to 15 months to actually show something happened out there? Administrator Hunter, Deputy Administrator O'Malley. Yeah, I, I guess I would add two things. First of all, um, we have some legacy mill five bond money that's been authorized that has not been um, sold on the bond market because we didn't know how it was going to be and we didn't want to get it tied up with the two year spend down. But that is still available if if there is a phased in project that work. We have money that's already you know on the books, if you will. Um, the only other thing I would add is we met with um, the federal uh, delegate, or one of the federal uh, delegations on some discretionary spending, um, what used to be known as the earmark, um, and we are looking at using this project for a, an earmark application. And Shelly, when's that application due? <laughs> March 15th. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, this gave us, and they seemed very excited because um, the good thing is we can ask for a lot, and if they don't have a lot to give us, um, we can pick which items or amenities we want to feature, and we can still, you know, make a splash with that. And that's, those are exactly the kind of projects that they like that have some fluidity with the, the, the volume of money, but still it's not like if they didn't fund it all, then we can't do the project at all. That's not the case in this particular instance. So it makes us a great candidate for that. Thank you, Administrator Hunter. Uh, Councillor Pease, uh, yes. So just one final uh, comment. I'd li- I wish we can make sure that when we pick a project and uh, we say, okay, we're going to earmark X amount of dollars for this project, that we also earmark a time frame. Because I find out what's happening a lot is we say, yeah, we're going to allot X amount of dollars to this project, and before it even gets out to bid, it's already increased in cost. Uh, we should have a time frame for that so that we can move this stuff along and not add more monies to the project and eliminate that. Thank you. Yeah, agreed. Uh, anything you'd like to add, um, uh, Rob? No, it's been, it's been a, this project's been a pleasure. I think the staff has been great. Uh, we've had great experience here in Lewiston. Um, we're, ha- we're, we've been really excited to be working on this and, and the reception and the enthusiasm, enthusiasm has, has really been, um, kind of present throughout the project, so I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you for your help, and uh, thank you both to you and uh, Planner Norton for presenting this evening. Um, With that, I, I think we're done. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Yeah, thank you.